conference I was at. So <laughs> I'm at the tail end of that. You're at the, you're at the uh, end of a long day. If you've got this part of the video, you've got the live unedited edition of Home Gadget Geeks. It is September 7th, 2017, 8 to almost 8 p.m. Central in the Central, uh, 8 p.m. in the Central Time Zone. There we go. Uh, if you're listening to this video any other time but live, it just means you've caught, you've caught the recorded version. That's okay. We got a long play podcast. We're going to be around for a while. Go pop some popcorn. I wasn't podcasting, Paul. Popcorn sounds good tonight. I think if it wasn't so rude to eat popcorn while I was podcasting, I probably would do it. But uh, go pop some popcorn. Uh, come back. We'll get started here in a few minutes. If you're in the chat room, I would love uh, to get a sound check. So if you'd let me know, I'll tell them we are live. You uh, First time you've got this and you like it, join us Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Central, out here at theaverageguy.tv slash live. We're up against my friends over at the Podcasters Roundtable tonight, too. They're out there podcasting live tonight as well. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Peter says it sounds good. Awesome. Just came from your neck of the woods, Paul. I was hanging out in D.C. It's not that close to you, but it's closer than Omaha is. I appreciate yeah. the, uh, the note the other day. You were flying over me, and and uh, <laughs> <laughs> you gotten pretty close. Yeah, that was, that was tricky because, yeah, you know, when you connect to Southwest, you only have one device on, and then if you pay for it, I'm like, oh. How do I tweet this or do something with it? And that's mm -hmm. when I got a little creative with aiming at my own laptop's <laughs> camera. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just had to do it. I felt a little yeah. closer to you looking out the window. Yeah, in our in our famous flyover state. As I headed to uh, Las Vegas with 110 degrees three days in a row. Oh, <laughs> what was in Vegas again? Uh, VMworld. So almost 38,000 people roaming around Mandalay Bay. That's pretty cool. That was... Uh, yeah, last Sunday to Thursday. Static in the audio. Speak, Spreaker has static, he's saying, huh? Mm -hmm. Peter, how bad is it? Hold on, let me check the connection. I guess I can just listen to it. Let's let's do that. Since I'm on the page, let's just hear it. One, two, one, two, one, two. Check, check, check. Check, Spreaker, check. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight. Peter, that might be you, my friend. I don't hear any static. Does anyone else hear static? It's a little quiet. Let's try that. Check one, two, check one, two. On Spreaker, we're just checking the Spreaker connection. Checking one, two, a little bit louder. There's me counting. A speaker's a lot farther behind than I would anticipate. It's been um, since March since I did a hangout. I'm trying to remember. Okay, good. I got it back on automatic switch over. So I'm not showing up full screen. Are you, Am I on your end? Automatic, you know, switching whose face is showing? Yeah, it's, it's switching for us. It was working just now? Okay. So why why is mine an override? I can't seem to get it to automatic. Um, I turned no, off the it buttons. won't it won't switch for you. You'll have okay. to Okay. That's only for people watching. Got it. Guys, I'm not hearing any static. I'm on the channel right now and I'm not hearing anything. So come over and watch the video anyways. So yeah, Emily noticed a little static in the background as well, but much better. Hmm. Okay. I just don't hear it. 
Okay, well, I'm going to go with it. I appreciate you guys letting me know. It's a little quiet. Not sure why it's so quiet. Using a different browser, so. Yeah, no, it's not only on Spreaker, Peter, because I'm listening to Spreaker. <laughs> I don't hear it. So I don't know what to tell you. I don't. Uh, I just pulled up the live page and was out there. Yeah, it's great on YouTube. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Looks fine. I'm uh, I'm on Spreaker on the live page, so you might want to check that re re uh, refresh or something along those lines. Hold on. Let me let me check both players just to make sure real quick before we get started here. And uh, I'm just not hearing any static. It's quiet, but I'm not hearing it. So, all right, I'm going to quit thinking about that. We'll get started here. Just a minute. Let's get the script up. Thanks, guest. Guest one. Number one. Good job. Whoever that is. Must be Ken. Somebody. Yeah. And it went away. That's good. You know, thanks for the heads up, though. I always appreciate that. Helpful to know. It, if it's too crappy out there, then nobody listens to it. So it's available on the mobile app. Although I've got some problems with my mobile app on Android. It's going to take me a week or so to get them fixed before you can download it on Android again. All right. Paul, you ready? Sure. Right at the top of the hour. Hey, Renny. Rennie, Ken, Mike, Emily, Peter, good to see you guys. Welcome to another Thursday. Man, it has been a long week. I'm not gonna lie. I uh, all I, I left Sunday. It, well, we partied. My son had a birthday party on Saturday. We partied late. It was it was a lot of fun. Then I woke up early, flew to DC on Sunday. Then h- hung out with Christian and Ashton and John all day Sunday at John's place. That was a ton of fun. Got back late. Uh, mon- uh, that was Monday, Tuesday, all day work, Wednesday, all day fly back today, 7 a.m. conference. I did seven or eight interviews today, half hour interviews. Boom, Paul, bed, back up early, back at it tomorrow. I've got six, five more to do, five or six more to do tomorrow. And, uh, and then a busy weekend. So here's to, uh, here's to busy weekends. <laughs> This will be great. Here we go. Let me get this thing done. This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 325, recorded on September 7th, 2017. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios here in beautiful Bellevue, Nebraska. My favorite time of the year is fall, and it is here, football season has, uh, has kicked off, I think, just about everywhere, at least in the United States. And fall is in the air. Looking forward to some cooler weather so I can run more process, more Bitcoin processes on my things at home so I don't have to feel so bad about running those things. Of course, we post the show with world-class show notes each week out at the Average Guy. Dot TV. Don't forget, you can join us on the mobile app. I, I am having some problems with the Android version of that. It works if you already have it. But if you've been trying to get it, uh, they made some changes over there at Google, and I have to resubmit the app, and I had to buy the developer's uh, license to get it done. So if you're trying to download Home Gadget Geeks out at homegadgetgeeks.com and to our app, we want to thank LastPass for our sponsorship. By the way, I mentioned they were – I hadn't heard from back from them. I heard from Amber. We're getting that going again. They're on for a third year, so that's awesome. They'll be on the show here probably November. If you're trying to get it through Android, hang tight. I'm going to get it fixed. I'll let you know when. iPhone works great. Head out to homegadgetgeeks.com. And don't forget, the best way to support us is on the Patreon page. If you head out to theaverageguy.tv and look for the Patreon link, just click it there. Uh, don't forget, for the $1, you get pre and post show. I produce those every week now, and I make them available on the Patreon site. And you can get them from there. You can even There's even a subscribable uh, audio feed if you want to do it that way. If you if you want to know what goes on in the pre and post show, sometimes it's exciting, sometimes it's not. It's a potpourri of goodness. Sometimes it's just boring. If you want to get that, just uh, $1 on Patreon and, uh, and join us out there. We'll send it to you. And then don't forget, I had a question this week about our, we have an RSS. Uh, in fact, I was talking with Dwayne at the end of the show last week. 
And he was like, you know, I really wish you had a video RSS feed. I want to download the video. And we do. So if you head out to the averageguy.tv slash subscribe, I've got two feeds. They've been around for a long time. Maybe you didn't know it. I don't know why you would want that. One's 200 meg, the other's 400 meg. I don't know why you would, but people do. I get 100 or so downloads to each one of those channels every single week. You must like it or it's on automatic, one of the two. It just keeps showing up in the stats. And uh, so those stats don't lie. So if you want to get the video and you want to download it, you don't want to stream it, you want to download it, check out there's a video RSS feed for both large and small. That's for this show and Cyber Frontiers. All right, Paul Brarin is back. Paul, longtime friend of Home Gadget Geeks and all things really that, that we do. Paul, welcome back. Thank you. Always glad to be here, Jim. It has been uh, since, uh, well, many months since we last talked. Yeah, back back in the spring? Yeah, whether it's uh, on the air or off, uh, we, have, yeah, we haven't really stayed in touch. So, yeah, it's a lot of things yeah. to catch up on. I'm yeah. glad to be here tonight. Yeah, how, how are things on your end? Uh, you, well, I think last time we talked, you had just made the move over to VMware. And, uh, and how's that going and, and how are you enjoying it? Yeah, back in January, I joined VMware. Uh, there was a little travel, a bit of training in the beginning, but uh, it's been going great. And last week at VMworld was my first time as an employee where you've got almost 30,000 people there and you're representing the company kind of hosting guests. And as a unique perspective, because the previous years I've been there as a IBMer uh, speaking or as a blogger where they give you a, a blogger pass and treat you nicely that way. Well, now I'm an employee and they treat me as a blogger. I kind of get the best of both. It's just awesome uh, meeting new people. Um, getting to do some demos. And um, frankly, booth duty is not a big deal. Three, four hours of staying there talking to people about stuff I love talking about. It's actually kind of fun. So yeah. yeah it's kind of it's kind of fun because they come to you, right? I mean, that's the, yeah. the beauty of the booth duty is that you just stand there and they literally just come to you. And yep. you get you have some great conversations. Did you run, you know, tinkertry.com is your site. Did you did you run into any your I mean you get some pretty good numbers over to your site. Do you run into fans who are, are, are readers and who call you out on the stuff you wrote or, you know, those kinds of things? Do you run into those fan moments? I, I do. And that, like, well, you, like you said, you're, you're tweeting out where you are. I told people on my schedule three weeks in advance. You're hoping people, if they spent, you know, four to six grand to get to a conference, they want to make the best of it. And if they're hoping to meet you, I want to tell them where I am. So, yeah, there were a few people uh, that showed up either at my live demo or at the uh, booth just to say hi, saying they've read my stuff for a while. That is so much fun. Um, and of course, they might nerd out about hardware bits if they uh, have a server like mine. Um, There's one guy who was actually nervous doing it, and that made me feel nervous. It was just weird. <laughs> but it was, it <laughs> was, it was funny. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. Aw weird, but awesome too. Yeah. I mean, the, that he had read so much stuff and watched so many videos that was clear. He was just super thankful, and that made me feel pretty good. And it's nice. Um, and then we quickly tried to change topics into anything else so he'd feel more comfortable, and, and that was fine. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. the public tweets, too, I mean, it, it's just really cool. People stop by, and they, hey, here's me with Paul, and whatever. A lot of people do that at VMworld. Uh, so VMware, like, super social company and really good at community building and all that. That's one of the attraction of the company. So, yes, it's enterprise serious software, software company that makes enterprise software ready for running the stuff that people don't see right behind the scenes. But as far as the IT pros that use VMware, well, there's hundreds of thousands of customers, Jim. So it's a lot like, you know, Microsoft or other huge companies that can build quite a following. And people um, are into it. VMTN is what VMware now calls their community. You remember MSTN, of course, you being an a, uh, MVP. Um, well, VMware has similar programs as well around people that contribute to the community or speak at user groups like I've been doing for years well before I joined. So yeah, it's been very good, and the conference was a really nice mix of fun and learning and meeting new people. Paul, when we think about VM, the state of VM for the average consumer, you know, on the business side, it makes a lot of sense, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of work that goes into it at the at the you know at the enterprise level, and and I get all that. You probably have the best view into hobbyists that are that are into this VM space or, you know, we were the on the home server side, you know, we were those nerds who were trying to run home servers, you know, in our basement and, and have, you know, seven, eight, nine terabytes of storage, some more. Mm -hmm. And I imagine there are some enthusiasts in the VM space that are like that as well. So you you have folks who at home, you're you're one of them, you got a pretty monster stuff set up and and but 
when we think of the VM space for the consumer, do you think it's getting more traction, staying the same? Uh, is it is it dipping? How do you feel like for the consumer, you and me, that that market is today? Are we getting a lot of people doing it, or or where's that at today? Yeah, I'll start with say Hyper V being built into Windows 10. You know, good move in Microsoft's part, right? If someone's just trying to dabble and get one VM going that they occasionally fire up, great. But remember, they now have Linux in there, right? So maybe people fire that up less often. So I'd say, unless you're really an enthusiast or someone who actually cares to run multiple OSs, that tends to be an IT pro that needs to know, say, Linux, or someone that wants to run a, a Plex server uh, VM, even though it's a maybe corporate issue laptop, they're going to kind of carve that up as multiple VMs, right? Keeping their world separate. You get past maybe three VMs, especially now that you have well beyond 16 gig of RAM, even laptops. My laptop is 32 gig of RAM, which is awesome. Um, and a one terabyte uh, M.2 NVMe drive, which is really awesome. Those two things together, you can do a whole lot more with one laptop than run just one copy of Windows 10. And that's the thing that gets people going to maybe VMware Workstation, kicking it up a notch, or say Oracle VirtualBox where, okay, instead of just the, the Hyper-V built into Windows 10, maybe they're doing things that are a little more advanced, running VMs, they can right click the VM and pause it, snapshot it. Uh, what's a snapshot? You're about to mess around with a VM, Linux or Windows, doesn't matter. And you don't like what happened? You rewind in time instantly to 45 seconds ago before you messed it all up. That's called snapshots. And that's in VMware Workstation, for instance, versus like the free uh, virtualization. So now you're seduced and into some of the more advanced features, you get used to that, but now you try to go past three or four VMs on a laptop, you're running out of RAM there. Well, that's where home labs come in. You can get to 128 gig of RAM, uh, for around $2,000 and run dozens of VMs on one machine that's running at only like 60 watts at idle. So, you know, I've talked about that before in other, uh, our other podcasts together where I'm not trying to convince people unless they have a, a reason to learn enterprise software like ESXi. It is amazing at getting enterprise quality software in the hands of average people at home. And they, they have an eval experience program that gets you a 365 day license for a modest, roughly $200 or 180 discounted. So that's the equivalent of MSDN, right? For IT nerds that need to know VMware for work. And honestly, Jim, the market penetration is huge for VMware in the, in the enterprise. For running pro production workloads, uh, VMware is it for hundreds of thousands of companies out there. So if you have some inkling, you're trying to do this as part of your IT career, that's where the home lab taking a direction of using ESXi, the hypervisor installed on the bare metal meaning you put a USB key in a server, you install ESXi right in that USB key, it loads into memory, and then it's the fastest thing you can do to juggle dozens of VMs, even in a modest home lab. So hopefully I kind of summed it up. People have a progression, that tends to be where they're at. And yeah, my articles and videos tend to focus on those dumb little stumbling blocks that would prevent them from moving from a hypervisor that's installed on top of some other operating system they use versus one that's dedicated to take a machine and turn it into a virtualization server. And uh, those stumbling blocks are little and big, you know, licenses, 60-day uh, time bombs that annoy people. Well, just spend 200 bucks if you're serious about your IT career and you have a year with all the features. VMware does not hold back. It's pretty amazing what you can do in a home lab with a $200 license of software. It's really amazing. Uh, so that that's the enthusiasm I have for this for many years as you know, I've been blogging for six years about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And you've, your, your site is hot. I mean, it, it, it's probably, it's probably one of those, maybe top 10 out there uh, talking about these products. Do you, what's the feeling that you get um, for, the, for, for a beginner? So no, a lot of our listeners have done this before, but maybe we've picked up a few that this is the first time they've heard you. If you're thinking about getting into this and you've got some, you need some spare equipment, you can't just make this happen. Well, maybe you can't, but you know, you've got some spare equipment. What's really, Paul, the right way for someone very first time thinking about using, you know, the VMware? And now let's 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 set Hyper V aside for a second. Let's Microsoft mm -hmm. stuff, right? Let's when we think about VMware, what's the right entry point for somebody to get in? You you mentioned the sixty day trial, but kind of talk me through that really quick. What's the right way in? Well, hardware tends to be a big stumbling block. People hope they can just install it on any old four year old laptop they may have laying around. Um, you go eight years old, they can't even do sixty four bit OSs. So those days are over. Uh, you go four years old, okay, it might have uh, a Celeron or something where it's missing virtualization features. So that's also a no-go. And then finally, it might have a real tech NIC that has no enterprise-worthy driver. In other words, VMware shuns it and says, we're focusing on Dell, HP, Supermicro, Lenovo, all the enterprise vendors, and they're really not worried about getting your real tech NIC working. 
Is that a big deal? Is that a reason to be annoyed? Well, again, think of the market, the market that product is for. Yes, you can inject those drivers, but that would tend to share, scare people away a little bit. If they're not committed enough to maybe buy something that actually is known to run VMware well, then it might not be the best you know, use of their time. Um, because yes, you might be digging up a command line or doing a, a little bit of work to get third party off the shelf consumer hardware like Core i7 stuff that was never in, tested by anyone necessarily to run VMware well. So I'm not making it, I'm making it sound too hard to run. No, it runs great and is rather easy to install in about three minutes on machines that it is ready for. Those machines have been tested with it. It's things that are on the VMware compatibility list. I know that's kind of self-serving because as you know, I, I work with a, a ZND that's been really kind of the darling uh, taking over well beyond the Intel Nook. The Intel Nook tends to stop at 16 or 32 gig of RAM. ZND goes to 128 and has two 10 gig interfaces, totally changing the face of what people would buy for the last two years. Core i7 won't be on the VMware compatibility list. Xeon stuff will in a big way and works great. And you can see your fan RPMs and your temperatures, all those nerdy bits that you know HP microserver users are used to seeing under Windows. Well, you can see all those nerdy bits too under VMware with the right machine that's on the list without doing any work other than mounting an ISO, putting in something to install ESXi on, say where you want to install it, kind of walk away, set an IP address, point your browser to the IP, you're in business. You, that's, that's the starting point. My videos tend to take it from there that there's a few steps afterward if you want to do the fun stuff, like moving VMs from one machine in your house to another uh, without them stopping, you know, the cool stuff that's called vMotion, or just moving from one drive to another inside the same system without stopping with the VM still running. So those are the pieces that are a little more like intermediate classes or 201, you know, lessons. Uh, watch a video and get an idea of what cool stuff you can do after you took three or four minutes to get the hypervisor itself installed. There's a whole lot more, you know, awaiting you uh, once you get to that point. You, you mentioned a $200 price point for, for the average home user, assuming they have equipment that's compatible. And I'm, I'm assuming there's a list I could get to that would, that would tell me that. And then uh, is that, is that $200 price point kind of the entry you think for uh, maybe a more serious enthusiast, they're going to spend about $200 a year to run this at home? Yeah, because honestly, uh, you can download the free hypervisor and you can use features for 60 days and then the time bomb hits. So again, if it's part of your IT career, even a small sliver of it, or a chance you might want to know ESXi and how to install it, then yeah, I would. it's a better way to go to put a little bit of money into yourself, just like you would with TechNet or MSDN, and say, okay, uh, my time is worth enough to not have to deal with a 60-day time bomb. And you can renew before 365 days are up and just keep the license going, not have to rebuild your home lab. Kind of a big deal if your home lab gets complicated over the years. So I'm now sharing desktop, Jim. You're seeing that okay? Yep. Let me uh, let me focus on you. There we go. All right. So yeah, you're talking about you know hardware and software. So let me start with this. Uh, the fresh VM. It has no browser history, but there that worked. Okay. So VMTN reincarnated eval experience is to VM professionals what MSDN TechNet is to Microsoft professionals. That's a little old article, 2015. Uh, the thing that was shocking to me is tens of thousands of people read this. So that's awesome. It's posting an article like that on my site that I wrote having no idea that people would find it uh, even better because I talk about home lab stuff a lot, right? Virtualization, storage, backup. It, it, it makes sense to tell people, hey, here's how to get your you know, $200 key and exactly what to do and what to click on. And, what the benefits are. So, so yes, Jim, that's that's the starting point for the software. And then the hardware, I can show you um, a couple things. So this particular machine, all right. Hardware compatibility list or HCL, people I give it an acronym under Windows. So here's what the site looks like. This is a VMware site. You type in some model and type of machine and that shows this particular machine is actually on the list. That means you have some level of assurance with this particular release, it's gonna work fine. And that's the gist of it. So uh, a lot of machines just, you know, won't high end with a, a GPU. Well, VMware is actually headless. You're not using the local GPU generally for anything. You just, uh, the local display um, is not used for high end graphical output or something. That's often a kind of a shock to people. So yeah, um, thanks Jim. And so my day job where it intersects with uh, evening, you know, tinkering has to do mostly with storage. Right, so you remember our quest seven, eight years ago to take a bunch of drives and pull them together. That was home server, right? 
And we alluded to this a little bit on the pod, last podcast. What do you do when you have three, four terabytes of storage, but drives back then were only one terabyte in size? You make a RAID array or you use Windows Home Server, right? That's where the journey started for me, this, I, this IT career business of helping customers with enterprise storage at work, you know, huge companies with many tens of terabytes or hundreds of terabytes or even now petabytes these days, right? And uh, the tinkering at home kind of came in handy <laughs> with my day job more and more is what I was finding over time. So uh, Microsoft calls their storage aggregation now storage spaces, right? And then VMware calls theirs vSAN. So that's what we're talking about where, um, here, let me turn this off for a second. Screen sharing, where did it go? Uh, my, oh, left-hand side. Yeah, I'm just trying to turn it off. I already titled yeah. it on. Am I back to my face? Yeah, I'm back you to my are. face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Jim, that, that's the story, but really has to do with uh, SATA drives are slow. Um, you put them in a server and stick Windows or VMware on there, okay. But when you start to run two or three VMs on a SATA drive, even if it's an SSD, not great. It bogs down. You try to boot two or three VMs at once, your performance tanks to like one-tenth what it should be. That kind of bothers a guy like me. If you spent one or two grand in a machine, you don't want to do that. So the latest storage tends to be NVMe, and that's an acronym I've written about over and over again. <laughs> I'll just give you an idea here. Um, because yes, it costs about twice as much per gigabyte, but it's also five or six times faster. So spend a little money, go with NVMe. Here I've got 1,940 references to NVMe over the last two years since it came out. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, you're I can you're passionate about it. Yeah, uh, um, well, you while, you're, while you're there, why don't you show this, the screenshot? So Intel has a new device out. There you go. Let's yep. talk about it. All right. Actually, I want to show a tweet too, but uh, so what's this form factor, this ruler thing? All right, so this is a little history of form factors. And this isn't just an enterprise story, right? I'm trying to keep a focus on home labs and what you might actually use in a home lab. Well, let's look at this picture here a little closer. Gum stick form factor, quite common in laptops. You might have a gum stick in your uh, Microsoft Surface. Uh, you don't even know it, it or some, yep, yep. Yeah, I think it did. So M.2 is often there. NVMe is the protocol, meaning if you go in the BIOS and look around, you don't see anything SATA-like. You're not stuck at uh, SATA 3 speeds, which is 540 megabytes per second or something. You're at four, five, six times that speed, even on a laptop, okay? Now you put that in a server, like the little compact uh, ZNDs, and you have a decent amount of airflow across it, just a little bit of air. And guess what? They run full speed for many minutes without throttling. In a laptop, as you know, because of battery concerns and the temperature of the CPU, you run something high-end, video editing, whatever, it tends to crank up the fan and then starts throttling the gigahertz, right? So that's M2 is just kind of taking over and being the, the cheapest format to get for consumer stuff like the Samsung 960 Pro and 960 Evo, which had their problems when they first came out of Christmas, but now the firmwares have fixed all that. So that's M.2. U.2, a little more enterprisey. That's just a form factor. that looks like a thick laptop drive, 2.5 inch. Ah, thank you, Jim. I was not showing my desktop. Sorry. Now you're showing me. I got it up. You bet. Yep. And then finally, add-in card, AIC. That's just uh, Intel's acronym for an add-in card. That's a PCI slot. Finally, what the heck is the ruler? The ruler is their desire to go all the way to a petabyte in a one-use server. Whoa. Um, and handle from a temperature perspective. So that's kind of a big deal. How do you shove a bunch of NAND chips, that's the ruler, onto one entity, which is one U high. So this device you're holding, it's about the size of a um, one foot ruler and a little bit thicker, typically than your wooden ruler you might have laying around, which, what do you know, I have one right here. Um, and they had it right there in the front and center when you walked into VMworld, kind of cool, a big Intel booth. It's the first thing we spotted and many of us were tweeting away on that thing Sunday. It's like, oh, there it is in the wild. We just saw Intel announce this a couple weeks ago and here it is at VMworld, one of those cool moments. And of course I saw some familiar names of people I had met. So that's, that's the ruler, Jim. Um, there's a little bit more. The M.2, the top one that was there, there's a wider one now called NGFF. Here, let me show that on my desk here. Go back to, oh, you got it. No, it's okay. I'll, yeah, I'll, let, you, I'll, I'll let, let you my desk over. Yeah. Okay, back to my... Uh... By the way, if you're listening to this on the audio, I say this all the time, this would be a good one to come over and watch on YouTube. Yeah, and I'll try to explain what I'm seeing. I, I always forget that rather important detail. Yeah. People Sorry. can't always see what I'm doing. All right, so now it does not want to share just that window. Let me click cancel mm -hmm. and try to share again. Application window. And now it's working. 
Awesome. You got a little lag. You seeing my ruler yep. there now? Cool. Yep, we are. You bet. All right. Next thing that happened is yet another form factor. Samsung and others. Um, what's this? Another acronym, NGFF. <laughs> uh, it's a fat gum stick. So here in their booth, instead of a long ruler form factor with a bunch of NAND, a bunch of flash chips like you've been used to using for the last nine years, uh, it, it takes the gum stick form factor and just bakes it a little wider. So imagine this, but about 20% wider on both sides. So same motherboard, same clearances, except you need more clearance on the side. All right, so that's quite a mouthful. A lot of form factors going on these days in the enterprise and home. Home, mostly M.2, enterprise, who knows? Lots of different competing form factors. Paul, what's the, what's so on this, on this ruler, what are we talking about from a price point? Mm, not released yet. I don't think they talked about that. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. I mean, they were holding one. I can't remember asking the capacity. No, um, I did get them on film. I don't think he talks about price on camera, uh, but let's go to the ruler here. Uh, there's me. I'm holding a ruler here in this video. And I think I might talk about the capacity at some point. And here's a picture I took of it versus a PCIe card. All right. So Jim, that's the last one. And this was pretty awesome uh, and fun this summer. So here I'm on my little site, been doing it for years. And I wasn't kidding when I said world's first close look. Um, lots of bloggers had remote access to this in April. I actually had my hands on one in August. It was pretty fun to be the first you know, nerd holding that particular device in the world as the world's fastest storage that anyone ships at this moment in time or is about to ship. So strangely, it's many weeks later and it's still not quite shipping. It seems to keep showing two weeks from now on Amazon. So it's going to start filling the world you know, later in September, I'd say. That's an $1,800 device at 375 gig. That is a high cost per gigabyte. But again, we're talking about a whole new storage tech in here. And that is not NAND that you've been used to has poor write endurance or doesn't really like being filled 100%, gets crummy performance. This is at a molecular level, basically all the construction all the way down to the chip level is a completely different animal. So Optine is Intel's branding of what's called 3D Crosspoint. So I try to jam all that in the title. 3D Crosspoint is Optine by Intel or by Micron, I'll be calling it uh, something else, maybe Quantex or something. Okay. So um, yeah, test drove that, kicked the tires on it, got to do some unboxing. And it's still working just fine in my home lab. Let me show you something here. Okay, that window acted a little funny. It wasn't full screen. Are you seeing everything just fine? You're now seeing a Windows yeah. desktop, right? Yep. All right. So as we finish up this uh, kind of high-end, you know, enterprise, what might come to your home labs soon? Well, I want to drive the point home. Gamers are going to get a PCIe card that's more for them, not an enterprise price, much more reasonably priced, and a firmware that makes more sense at home so you don't like accidentally brick it when it acts a little funny one day or whatever. Enterprise products are meant to basically brick themselves and get out of the way if something bad happens, right? Because you got 50 more of them um, or an array of some sort or redundancy. At home, you don't have that. So you don't really want enterprise products in your home. So you might want to wait a few months maybe. We don't really know when Intel will do that. But yes, they've, everyone knows they're going to come out with Optane for the home enthusiast that likes to run games and stuff. And it's probably going to be a PCI card uh, for now. And it runs about 15 watts or something when it's burning. So it's more than the M.2. It's not going to be M.2 all that soon, the tiny form factor. OK, so I'll just quickly show you. Here's probably one of the world's fastest reboots you'll see. Um, and you've probably never seen uh, Intel Optane before. In the coming weeks, you should see uh, many blogs talking about this as they get their hands on it. Let me just go ahead and do a little reboot. So you're looking at a VM here. Reboot is not the most amazing test, but it's still kind of fun and basic. Um, you'll get a sense that. Even Windows Server 2016, that has a whole lot of services that start and stop when you reboot it, can be pretty snappy, uh, looking pretty much like Windows 10. So here it goes. It's now rebooting. You're seeing the BIOS, which is a VM. There's the flag. There's the animation. People are listening to this podcast, so I'm explaining what's going on because it just took about seven seconds to get to the desktop. And you're in. And I'm in. I'm going to right-click and go to Task Manager real quickly. Click on performance, CPU is down to under 2%, under 1%. It's ready to do stuff. It's not like you're waiting around 45, three minutes, four minutes, like Windows usually takes, even on a decent laptop, right? So you just saw a pretty remarkable demo that was a blast for me to have. Just loaner gear, have to give it back to Intel soon. But man, was it fun to fly to the VMworld with this and show it off to people that came in line to my uh, demo area. How'd you pack that? 
I mean, that's, I, I'd be, did you carry, carry it with you or? Sure did. did. It? State, yeah. state and Southwest is generous. You bring stuff on the plane. You can check up to two 50 pound bags with them. They're quite generous with luggage, which is amazing. I didn't have that much though. The server's only 12 pounds. Uh, this card was inside the server. It's rather tiny. If you look at my hands holding it, it's just a half height, half length PCIe card. So not a big deal to pack and uh, not a big deal to demo. Let's see, uh, you asked. So the demo I did at VMworld, Looks like this. You see me standing with a bunch of uh, colleagues, friends, visitors, and the server is in front of me, way in front of me, actually. It's pretty small. It's only like 10 inches high, eight inches wide. So there, that's it. Packing, that was no big deal. I have wheelie bag luggage that puts it right in the overhead bin, even on the smaller planes. And this is the entire data center, what it looks like, Jim. Uh, a deck of cards for scale. Okay. And uh, what's the, so give us the specs on this, what we're looking at right now. From so yeah, the machine on the left here has, you know, it can have a 10 terabyte drive when I'm home. I don't fly with that, but 3.5 inch base, three of them. Um, and 120 gig of RAM, 12 cores or eight cores. The eight core is the one I fly with. The 12 core is the one I use uh, for my day-to-day -day, um, blogging and 4K video creation and everything else. And I call it a traveling data center because I got a battery and a router and a switch and everything there with me. And, um, you know, some of that stuff I want to talk about tonight, like this $90 piece of gear I'm pointing to with my mouse there. People uh, can't see that on the podcast. I'm talking about an Ubiquiti uh, Edgemax light router. So that's a product I've talked about for a while. Quite good for home labs where you have Linux and Windows that need to talk to each other on a first name basis or fully qualified name or by IP address. Everybody can see each other by name with a non-consumer router. That's a little more enthusiast grade, a little harder to set up than your average, you know, D-Link, Netgear, Linksys. So that's part of why I do this demo is I bring all this stuff so I can show all the pieces of my compact 66 watt home watt home data center, everything there with me um, that I use at home is what goes with me on the road. Yeah, let's talk about Paul. Let's make the uh, make a shift. Um, well, hold on before we do that. So, okay. um, pricing wise, what what do you think in that picture for a typical user? What am I spending on that? Which that you got right there. Okay, um, you're getting close to two grand with 64 gig of RAM, and unfortunately, RAM's gone up. The 32 gig RAM sticks. So now you're over two grand with uh, RAM, and you still need to add storage. This is not a, a cheap system. Until you can get a one U version of it, a tiny, you know, one U uh, compact version, uh, starting under a thousand with no RAM, but it's a kit like an Intel Nook. You still got to add RAM. So to go to a 64 gig of RAM, you're still looking at 12 or 1300 with no drives yet. So the price, though, being within 20% of a Nook, but four times the memory and all, yeah, it's it's quite appealing. Yeah. And and there was a la that the lab they ran live at VMworld uh, with 10 of those, 10 of these, the small versions of this. And they have less cores. Instead of eight cores, you got six. But yeah, you can get the price uh, down quite a bit. And just to finish that up, so for when he's just getting started, this kind of summarizes. Here's Intel Nook, and here's all the other ones and the models. And this table I built actually has price too. So take your try to com forward slash compare. Uh, prices change. I would encourage you to check them. So I just gave you some round numbers. Um, so yeah, that's just one system, Jim. But strangely, in the home enthusiast environment, there's no other servers on the VMware compatibility list. So now you can know why. It's not a surprise why I put my time and efforts, evenings and weekends, into one particular server. It's because only one company shipping a server that's a turnkey solution. We just plug it in and power it on and you have already for installing VMware. All the others tend to be motherboards and you gotta buy a case and a power supply, right? And get your memory dims matched and all that. And that's not a big deal, but you know, I wish there were a whole lot of Core i7s and consumer stuff, but it's just not gonna go that way, I doubt it. There's plenty of enterprise gear that supports VMware for a decade already. They really don't have any financial interest to worry about adding Core i7 com consumer products or Core i9 now or... Yeah. On, so yeah I keep 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 it on the keep it at the enterprise grade i think that's where they want to be right they want to stay yep. in that space yeah yeah no, no, make cool. no secret about that yep but it can run quite well is the whole point here all right so yeah i had some other ideas too of cool stuff to show off in that but um so jim maybe if i just finish with like yeah the router so let me let me just fire that yeah, up. Do that. Why, awesome. why would a router be exciting well i have 300 megabits down and 30 up you and i've talked about cox communications before jim we both share that you in Nebraska, me in Connecticut, and then they clamp down with caps. But at least there's a couple things. With a router, you can actually kind of keep an eye on your bandwidth. Talk about that just a little bit. Um, but also, when you go up to 300 megabits, that's you know one third of a gigabit connection. A lot of consumer routers can't do that. Right? So if you have a four-year-old router or a $60 router, 
it's not going to handle that much packet switching, like period. So that's one thing. And I just showed my home's IP. Well, I'll need to change IP addresses after the podcast. That's fine. It's no problem. Um, and everything's blocked. You know, firewall, there's no port forwarding on anyway, right? So nothing would happen. So DNS is the thing that's key in a home lab. And you make reservations. So yeah, you have a device, you fire it up, you give it a static Mac uh, IP address. And now in Linux or Windows, you type, you know, NSLOOKUP APC. What is that device for many machine in my house? It resolves it. doesn't matter if it's a Linux or Windows device. Sounds trivial, but that's what you really need for uh, for VMware to run really easily. Uh, issue certificates on its own. It really expects to have a name, not just an IP. The way we're headed when you try to simulate an enterprise at home is let's not simulate anymore. Let's just have something for 90 bucks that does true DNS. No Active Directory, no Windows Server needed. Just a $90 device solves that problem nicely. So uh, that's probably enough depth here. But if someone actually is interested and in more about that, yeah, this is what the device looks like. Ubiquity edge router light, coupled with an Eero for Wi-Fi, and putting the Eero in bridge mode. So DNS DHCP comes from the router. Eero does all my Wi-Fi. That combination's been uh, very good and, and very stable. And stability is rather nice to have. So out with the stuff on the left, and I just have these two devices in the right running my whole home um, for well over a year now. And that's fun to come back on the podcast and say, I have no regrets still, Jim. It's been going quite well both from Wi-Fi perspective, better than my house has ever had in the 21 years I've lived in this house. And then finally, the router, way more stable than any consumer brand, and I've tried them all. D-Link, Linksys, Netgear. Uh, you can ask my kids. There's a pile of purple and other color boxes gathering dust in my basement. Uh, they tended to need to be rebooted every few weeks or even several times a week or at least every month or two, much less than that, maybe once or twice a year. Uh, so it's been a good story there. Okay, so enough of that networking stuff. But yeah, you can... Nerd out, and I have articles all about that if someone is into trying to make a little more advanced router into something that looks a lot like a consumer device. My article gets into the exact commands and all that to do that. All right. Uh, so, Jim. Um, so, you're, the, yep. so, Paul, you're going to, you, you're, you're, you like that Eero. I'm huh? set up three pack, about 349 for this. Yeah, I don't have a, a, a huge home. Um, so, when we hear, Dave McCabe talking about many different rooms and needing so many arrows. Wow. Um, and I also don't have brick or anything, right? So I think I'm fine with three. It seems to do very well with all the bedrooms and the uh, downstairs and upstairs. So I have two levels in a basement. And I do fine with one hockey puck located kind of near the middle of each of those. Um, it's working out great. Uh, the speed was, you really need an iPhone 7 Plus or later. The chips in those later phones, like less than a year old, to really show off what ridiculous Wi-Fi speed you can get pretty much all over your house by buying some sort of uh, mesh gear. And there's many alternatives to Eero now, a year later, right? Eero was the, the starting point. Uh, it's rather nice. They come out with regular firmware updates, seem to be whole hog supporting uh, their product, coming out with a new generation and continuing to innovate even on the firmware of mine. That is a great feeling, uh, rather than being abandoned because there's new competitors, right? They just up yeah. their ante. Yeah, uh, drop okay. drop back in, uh, drop your picture back in, Paul, if you yeah, want. Yeah, sure, sure. Sorry, showing the boring windows. That one knows that one. Right. <laughs> They're like, all I see is windows. Okay, back to there, there you go. Um, yeah, well, interesting that you've you've landed on that. I mean, I think even from a home from a home um, you know home gadget geek, so to speak, uh, that Eero product uh, without the router, the Eero product, you would use, you would you endorse and say, hey, if you're putting Wi-Fi in. Even in a smaller home, that three pack, you you've liked that setup. That's worked well for you. Absolutely. Um, and I will say, like Dave McCabe, I do wire it, so I don't have to necessarily. But since I can do gigabit wiring throughout my house anyway, why wouldn't I just give it a wired backhaul? Is the word he uses right? Um, why have them talk mesh over each other and take up a channel? How about I just give them a wire? So it's part of why I'm making my first generation Eero perform fantastically is because all three hockey pucks throughout my house are wired to one network that is attached to my router. Not really the way you're supposed to wire, right? You're supposed to attach the URL right to the cable modem and let it do its thing. Uh, I don't do that. I put it in bridge mode and do DCP and, and DNS from a, a router device. So a little unique, kind of nerdy, not your typical thing where you just pull out the three pack from Best Buy and plug it right into your, you know, one right into your cable modem and the other two wirelessly somewhere else in the house. That's how they're designed, admittedly. But boy, they run great if you have the luxury of having wires run through everywhere. Yeah. And, um, Speaking of wires and uh, running everywhere. So uh, one of my sons helped me out with wiring up my house for 10 gig recently. So I needed a Cat7 cable from basement to attic. 
Uh, I shoved PVC pipe through a laundry room. My wife was maybe less than thrilled a decade ago, like why are you shoving PC, PVC pipe and making holes in the house? But I'm very glad I did. <laughs> it made it pretty easy to run a standard that wasn't around a decade ago, and that is 10 gig. And it wasn't very much money. Under 50 bucks got me 100 foot lengths, a Cat 7, all set. I can move things, VMs, uh, large 4K video files, whatever, anywhere in my house from the upstairs server to the downstairs server. That's called vMotion, we talked about that earlier. 10 gigs awesome and get used to it it's coming in more products there'll be 2.5 and 5 gig middlemen too with consumer switches that'll come out in those um at much more affordable prices right now 10 gig is like still six or eight hundred bucks for an eight port unit that's horrible uh, or a two port unit like i showed you in that traveling rig i go with that's about 250. so 10 gigs not that affordable from the switches yet but motherboards are going to be equipped with 10 gig much more soon it's been 10 years of one gig so it was time it's hard to believe it's been that long you know, yeah, yeah. when you start thinking about it and, and I think by now everybody's taking advantage of it. If I'm going to go from one to 10, going to have to make a wiring upgrade, right? Is that, that's going to be a whole house upgrade if I want to get it across the house. Is that right? Yeah. If you're cat six, a, and one of my articles does cover this a bit, but yeah, cat six, a, uh, you're probably good. I think up to hundred or maybe it's two fifty feet. You got to you know, look for some wiki articles to make sure you got it right. So don't conclude you need to rip out your cabling, but if you're cat five E and you're at hundred feet, I knew that could be pretty marginal for me to do 10 gig. I really wanted to see it stable. And I just went and replaced it. And with, I, I, cat, I, with Cat 7, is that what you said? Cat 7, Cat 6A would do too. And there's companies making ribbon cables now. So four of them together to go through that PVC nice and compact rather than the, the old days. Um, you know, this comes up a lot. I'm gonna show something here again. Um, and it's those, those little cables. So mono price, I think your audience would appreciate this. If you have a rack, when I say rack, stuff that's within 14 feet of each other, there's a pretty cool option for really thin cabling that people seem to like every time I show it to them at one of these public places I've demoed. And that is the, the material, the monoprice cables. They're called, uh, let me get that out. Sorry, slim run, that's the word that was eluding me. So slim run cables, CAT 6A, they're 10 gig capable and they're tiny. So let me go ahead and fire up, uh, let's go to Monoprice's site. You'll see how thin these are. That's what they look like. Let me get you a better sense of scale. You can buy five, here's a five pack for only $9, not that big a deal. You can get yourself a 10 pack, get the price down and you go only go up to 14 feet. So there's a catch to get such thinness. You're only going up to 14 feet. But boy, um, for the rack or for like what I was traveling with, let me show you a picture of the back. There you go. Now you get an idea. That'd be kind of a rat's nest with four thick cables and a fifth one for management all going here. Instead, there's plenty of room for airflow and you can kind of actually see what's going on in the back of my server because these servers or cables are so darn thin. They're awesome. So they get comments everywhere I go like, wow, server looks cool and all but Wow, those cables, where'd you get them? Yeah, Monoprice has been doing that for a year. If you're not aware of HDMI cables, they've gotten real thin these days too comes in handy when you travel with a 15 footer to attach to a, a monitor, like when you go to trade shows as well. So yeah, I got, I got one the other day inside of a product that I got um, and yep. it was, it was small, but it was thin the other way. It was like a pancake thin and it was really thin. I mean, it was one of those, I felt like it was going to come apart, but they really are trying to jam those things in smaller and smaller form factors and keep them, you know, kind of keep them out of the way. This one would have slid under something really nice. You know, you could have slid it in between a space that, that's not too wide and, uh, and and get pretty good cabling on it. So it's interesting. I hadn't thought about replacing cables. I Here in the here in the Collison uh, server room, it's pretty much your standard, you know, cables from 10 years ago. You know, when you look at them, that size, you know, that kind of standard size of network cabling. Uh, so it's probably something I should consider. And like you're saying here, not too terrible of an upgrade. From a cost perspective, you could get in there. There's probably, would you say those are 14 feet is what you said? Yeah, so it's the max length and, and that's what, for 30 bucks? I get five of those for 30 bucks at 14 feet, uh, something like that. So, yep. uh, you know, a, a nice little upgrade. I could probably, you know, use use 10 of those. Almost everything's within 14 feet and, uh, and get some really nice, um, kind of get some economies and not have, big, thick cables everywhere. It works, but that's kind of nice that you're getting these smaller options. Yeah, and ready for 10 gigs someday, right? So a little future proofing, 20 bucks on Amazon gets you a 10 pack, so two bucks a cable. 
but but chances are my equipment's not ready for 10 gig, right? If I'm running PC equipment that's a couple years old, or if I'm reusing some inexpensive switches, or you know those kinds of things, chances are I'm at one gig. Is that right? Do you think? Yeah, but like QNAP, I visited their booth, did a little 4K video, walking around with my phone and an external mic, and I recorded this guy, and he's showing me, and I zoom in and and show 10 gig options, even on their consumer focused ones. So. Even when you buy a NAS, especially if multiple machines in your house are hitting the NAS, 10 gig really starts making sense. Let's just hope by Christmas the switches to go with it really fall in price. That's still a sticking point. Because hmm. um, right here, this thing is still, I think, 600 bucks. This is the one that's uh, running in my basement full time now. Thanks. Let's see. Let's see the current price. 800. Ooh, went up. Yeah, that's brutal. So what's expected to happen is a bunch of consumer chips showed up. Let me show you that. Here we go. I have an adapter running 10 gig on my laptop. That sounds nuts, but this is a Dell XPS 15 equivalent. It's called the Dell Precision 5510, kind of the corporate version. And when you have Thunderbolt 3, you can do an adapter like this with Thunderbolt 3 on one side and 10 gig in the other. It can handle the bandwidth. And remember, it has NVMe storage inside, so we can actually push data and need 10 gig to move from one machine to another. So I have two servers and a laptop all at 10 gig. It's awesome. I've been building those building blocks for years. I only finally wired the house you know, last month. It felt great to do that. So these chips that are inside of these are auto switching all the way from two point, they do one gig, 2.5 gig, five gig, and 10 gig. That's what's coming to consumers on like Core i7, Core i9, Core i9 probably first uh, this year. So you, hopefully there'll be a whole wave of new switches that are way more affordable. Um, speaking of uh, gear for laptops, this might be more broadly applicable to an audience. If you have USB-C, you might find the pick, slim pickings for Thunderbolt 3 docking stations and I think there's only one right now there was supposed to be one from Lenovo and they pulled it I had a back order for four months and finally they said never mind we canceled your order um, here's the key when you look at docking stations and you want the ability to maybe plug in a hard drive or something on another Thunderbolt port you need an expensive dock because you really want a port in the back that actually does Thunderbolt again in other words you don't want to take up your laptops one Thunderbolt port and then you can never do anything else uh, like a hard drive or an external RAID, or uh, in my case, a USB, sorry, a Thunderbolt USB-C connection that goes to my 10 gig adapter. So right now I have this whole, I have three monitors, um, everything running on one. So finally I made it to that one cable dream many people have had for a long time. Let me see where I got that cable. There we go. Uh, I have a picture of the laptop somewhere in here. Uh, where do I have it? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. No, I know where it is. I'm sorry. I'm making anyone dizzy who's trying to watch me on video. I, I just had a seizure. Yeah, I just had a seizure. Okay, well. <laughs> no, you're, good. you're good. Keep going. <laughs> and there it is. The picture I wanted to show you. This is everyone's dream. <laughs> One cable for a laptop, right? It's charging, and it's a high-end laptop. It's a Core i7. It can handle the watts. You need a beefy dock for that. You're not going to get a buy with a $100 Thunderbolt dock. You're going to be setting 200 bucks it up, is my point. But if you do that, there it is. The dream's alive. Big power brick up here, giving this blue power light to the big Dell dock, and then just one skinny little cable going to the laptop itself. And then this little box on top is my 10 gig. It's crazy, but I use it. I use it all the time. 4K videos, files are huge, Jim, and moving them around from one machine to another can be uh, rather slow, even on one gig. Watching things happen you know, in 10 seconds it used to take uh, minutes is pretty awesome. Yeah, you you know it's funny. You a lot of the videos 4K that you're doing are doing for the job to show these things. It's a kind of a self perpetuating thing that you're doing there, right? And it, it uh, right, you're shooting a lot of those videos for what shows up on your site. Yeah, unboxing things or hybrid, you know, unboxing an Intel Optane. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm holding an Intel Optane. Lots of uh, it's awesome to be publishing a video, and if I'm unboxing and trying to show it close and every little chip and. All the pieces, yeah, I, I have it well lit, and I use 4K mode in the camera, which is not so fun to edit. <laughs> it's, it's pretty bulky stuff and hard on disk space and all that, but it is nice uh, to be able to zoom in, and sometimes you have something you want to crop, you can zoom in on Camtasia post-production, and it's still quite good quality. So most people are watching in 1080, right? But you can maintain that quality even if you have to zoom and crop on a video. So yeah, 4K is common, uh, you know, and it's quite common on laptops, including you know my laptop here. Mm -hmm. 4K on a travel laptop is weird, by the way, but uh, it can be problematic because external projectors are not using it. But right. you will see, I'm so spoiled by multiple monitors, I have a secondary monitor here. It's using Thunderbolt 3, a USB-C cable hooking up to my laptop. 
there's no battery in it. There's no power button that you need to use. You just plug it into your laptop. The second screen pops up. Now you're sitting in a hotel room using two monitors. Awesome. Re retail on that is what? Let's have a look at the current price. They've now replaced it with a new model. So let's see if it's still on Amazon, the previous one. Okay, you can buy used 172, 166. So because oh, so it's terrible. Well, no, but the new one that replaced this, so mm -hmm. this is Asus 15.6 inch, meaning it matches my laptop screen size. Uh, the new one is actually 300 or something. And oh, forget it. I guess I'll have to find it later. Um, Maybe LCD travel. It's IPS to screen. There it is. 249. 249. And wait, there is more. Let me just show it to you. There we go. So they made the bezel even thinner. It's obviously not on right now. And my Logitech camera is using the USB-C port. So my laptop has only one USB-C port. Mm -hmm. I can't turn this on right now. But look how small they made the bezel. In other words, it basically looks like this a Dell XPS 15, a very thin bezel laptop right next to it. Um, and they've made a better case. Uh, so yeah, there you go, Jim. And it has kind of an origami, origami magnetic thing folding up here. And now it stands up. Pretty simple assembly and two positions for two different angles. So they do a good mm -hmm. job. I have a very close 4K unboxing video. I don't think I actually have that one published yet on that display. A lot of things we're talking about haven't quite published, Jim, but you and I often do that, talk about things I'm about to uh, write about soon. Yeah. People want to stay tinkertry.com. You want to stay close to that if you want to go out there and, and see some of these things that we've talked about. Uh, I haven't had a lot of envy. I mean, okay, uh, 10 gig networking, uh, that's, that's okay for me. Some of the other things you've shown, uh, the hard drive stuff's way out of my league. But that monitor, Paul, that monitor, I, I'm a little jealous of that monitor. That's a, if I was going to spend for 250, have an extra one, travel. Now I end up sometimes I just carry a cable with me. I plug into the hotel, you know, I drag the TV over and I just plug into that to get an extra monitor. But that's uh, that's pretty nice. Yeah. Um, look at the thinness too. Right. So adding to my travel bag, a whopping two pounds, not a big deal. And adding maybe a centimeter and a half, maybe do, a little bit more. Do you take it out when you go through TSA? Do you take it out? Uh, Generally, no, haven't had to because yeah. they don't really see it as laptop. There's no keyboard or anything. Right. Um, yeah, Jim, when I, I'm not your typical traveler. I work, customers doing all kinds of stuff in the day, and then at night I'm writing stuff. I'm using two monitors in a room constantly. So being in a hotel room and having two monitors, by far the biggest productivity boost of any other accessory I could yeah. ever buy. No. With every penny of that for me. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. I've, I've found, though, I have found in a pinch, I carry a HDMI cable with me. And in a pinch, I can almost always, in the places I stay, it's not the greatest, not always the greatest resolution, but I can drag that TV over, plug it in, and uh, and be up and running on a, with a second monitor. Again, a little awkward, but it, it does work in a pinch. That works in a pinch for me. Yep. Um, and you saw some weirdness in my picture, too. I have some other accessories and a mouse. Uh, you get pretty particular, right? If you're yeah. writing for six yeah. years, you, get, you have your productivity tools. You really like to have them on the road, and they really don't have much to travel weight. Right. Um there was a couple other updates from when you and I last talked too. Let's see. So it could be a thermostat that's coming up in two years. Cool. They have a new one. I don't really necessarily need to have Amazon Echo or Echo like capabilities. You're talking to it. I'm okay with it. You know, we've got it programmed in a way my wife and I are comfortable with it. That's not always easy changing seasons. We have air conditioning and then we have baseboard heating and having it to have two separate programs where you can just kind of swap between one set of settings to another. It doesn't really do that. So here we are two years into its product life cycle. I don't think Nest does it either, um, where you can just say, here's what I do in the summer, here's what I do in the winter. I have to kind of manually reset everything every spring and fall. Not a big deal, still a successful project. They're quite reliable. I did have a voltage issue um, where I had to add a transformer to it. A little weird, but that's common in houses where you have only two wires when you open up the wall, and now you're like, oh, this is not supposed to be a battery operated device, it's supposed to get voltage from a transformer somewhere, and now you're fishing wires through walls. No big shocker, that's Ecobee's story, but Guess what? The same exact thing happened to me, Jim, about a year ago with Bring Video Doorbell Pro. I returned the original one, had some problems with it, went to the Pro, was a little better, but still had some issues with um, reliability. Finally, replaced the transformer, the little thing that you see a lump in your basement somewhere, probably near your, um, well, it could be anywhere in your house, really, but a little transformer that's running your front doorbell for your home. I replaced mine with a brick one, and those problems went away. Oh. So I, the same exact transformer I ended up using for both my Ecobee to give it its own voltage regulating, you know, a little 
power supply, ended up doing the same thing for a ring video doorbell. So those projects didn't end up being beginner easy, you know, 10 minute affairs. Both of them turned into multi-hour troubleshooting, talking to tech support. But in the end, that is fun. You know, you bought it in the first two, three months it came out, you know you're in for it. It's fine. And then it's extra cool to just blog about it and to help people avoid that other pain. And people like Jamie reaching out to me directly. It was pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, He's a good guy. How, how, um, how old do you think uh, the transformers you were trying to use or the transformer for the ring doorbell was? How old do you think that? The de- I mean, is there some advice that if you're going to put some of these newer devices in, you should probably upgrade your transformers to have a newer one? Well, the house is 21 years old. So let's see. Actually built in 94. And let me go ahead and share out that desktop again and show the transformer. I would be very, very careful. Work with tech support. Don't take any advice I'm telling you here on this podcast um, because we're talking about your safety in your home and the thickness and gauge of your wires. So I wouldn't want you to do something dangerous. So if you have thin wires that were never meant for anything uh, but a doorbell or even going from, uh, was it 16 to 20 volts and it can't handle it, that could be bad. Things might heat up. You might melt through insulation. Wouldn't want you to do that. So... Both Ring and Ecobee 3 are fantastic on the phone. They're unbelievable. They could be on the phone with you for hours with top engineers telling you all kinds of electrical stuff to make sure you buy the right stuff that's safe. So there you go. That's my disclaimer. Just be very careful with what you do um, and call those companies for tech support. None of my articles are any kind of substitute for that. All right, back to the Hangout. Let me share the desktop and just show you a couple of tips there. So I imagine, Jim, your audience, people listening to you and... and um, Dave McCabe, yeah, there's probably a fair amount of Ecobee and Ring owners. And now I guess there's a new Nest too, right? So uh, something finally happening with that product again, which is kind of good for the uh, industry to keep moving forward, competition. All right, so here it is. Let's go to this article. And I've got a picture. There you go. 24 volt transformer. Uh, $10.49, Amazon Prime, two days later arrives, and all my problems went away with my doorbell, and any problems I had with having to wire up my basement thermostat were gone. So you'll see right there, it shows 26 volts without load. I'm like, really, is that normal? Having an engineer from Ring, and you could be telling me that's fine. That's reassuring, right? But again, don't do this without knowing what gauge wiring you have, or if you really don't know what you're doing, you're not comfortable. Would not recommend it. It's now a year later. There's plenty of people like me that have talked about this stuff. You're no longer a pioneer blazing new trails if you buy a Ring Video Doorbell Pro or Ecobee 3. Right? They're well into their product life cycle. So I hope, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, we, we've worked in, I don't know, I shouldn't say we. I'm considering it now that we think, you know, we, we thought we might move next summer. We've got some other things going on, a wedding and some other things happening um, that are making me think, well, maybe we'll stay for another couple of years. And I shouldn't say it too loud because Sarah really wants to move. But um, uh, I'd love to have, I, I put a, a homemade uh, webcam on the front porch just to kind of have something out there. It's not really working. It doesn't, the, I haven't purchased a subscription to get the motion sensor working and those kinds of things. But I got, uh, you know, I got it on the, on the, on the front door. And I keep thinking, well, that, that ring looks better and better all the time so i don't know as soon as i buy it we'll move you know it's going to be one of those things yep and all iot devices internet of things if you have a choice one little tip i've heard people say is because things are attack vectors for your home network right anything could get breached at some point there might be a vulnerability in the code Uh, even ring had a scrape with i guess you could rip it off the front door and you could actually extract the 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 web key for your home's wi-fi that kind of nasty stuff right so i just joined mine to my guest wi-fi that's one way around it, right? So if someone's on my guest Wi-Fi, it's not as big a deal as if they're actually on my Wi-Fi, which is my home network, right? So these Internet of Things devices tend to be uh, kind of less awesome from a networking stack. They're super cheap Linux, and things happen. <laughs> so I'll just kind of leave it at that. So I, I don't go nuts with Internet of Things, and I don't have a ton of junk on my home that I don't trust, and I don't really want to have to watch some video uh, $70 streaming webcam that I bought. Um, that does Wi-Fi also from you know years ago. I just let it gather dust. I don't really want to track all its Linux vulnerabilities that come out every week and patch it. it it's a nasty world out there for this stuff. But at least with Ring, Ecobee, the stuff I talked about today, and uh, Eero, all those seem heavily supported by their vendors and regularly firmware updated. Way more than any Linksys router ever did, right? Those things, they'd orphan after a year. They never come out with a firmware again. 
Now you get to year two and three and some vulnerability happens, you're basically faced with replacing the whole darn thing. That might happen here too. <laughs> we don't know. These are still pretty new products, but and that's just a shame, asking people to spend 250 bucks every two, three years. I'd rather leave this stuff in my house for 10 years, frankly. No, for sure. For sure. We, we've gotten, I'll flip your picture back, but yeah. we have, um, we have gotten, this is, I think this is a problem that we have gotten conditioned to, to buy these 250 and $300 devices that used to last a decade or two that are now two and a half, maybe three years in some, you know, before something either wears out or they get outdated or the services stop or they get right. They, they stop talking to things. And so I, I do get a little concerned when I think about some of these, these more expensive devices that we expect for you know, some, even in the $500 price range, you showed some stuff here tonight, you know, uh, six or $700 price range. And they're, you know, I, you're not maybe getting the longevity that you used to or think you would be getting out of some of these purchases. You know, my parents didn't even think, my, my parents never replaced their thermostat. Like that wasn't even, it was the original one that we moved into the house, you know, and that house was built in 1957. That was a thermostat. And we used the same thermostat until they sold the house in 1992. And we just, you know, we're adding more of these units and they see it to me, it just seems like they're going faster and we're paying more. So it is, a, I think it is a concern for a lot of people. I mean, I think they're just like, you know, is a nest, if I buy a nest today, is that going to give me more than five years of use uh, before something goes out? It not go, physically goes out in it, but maybe services stop or you've got to upgrade and it won't upgrade anymore. You know, and you mentioned it before, security issues. They find stuff in them and you you just said yourself, I'm not going to take an old camera and be patching it all the time. Do we want to be patching our nest thermostat or being worried about it for, you know, beyond the four or five year mark? I don't know. I'm not saying, I'm not making a determination there, but I think we got to think a little bit differently about it than we used to. Yep. That's kind of a business model thing. If you're in the business of making something as cheap as possible to show up at Costco and you know, how incented are you to keep that product running three, four years later when you really just want to sell someone a new one? That's a problem for the quality of the code and paying yeah. developers to want to care about that old unit and all that. And when you're dropping two or three or 400 bucks on it, that's, that's, that's a big deal. So let, let me, uh, on a more positive note, so it's something like Ecobee 3. It, it's awesome to just, that they're just getting started with trying to make your house smarter. But I just said, just getting started. Like smart thermostats to see what room, each room temp is, and then average out those two rooms that I care about when I'm working at home and keep them comfortable and ignore the rest of the house. I love that stuff, right? That's a huge step in the right direction. But wow, wouldn't it be better if your air handler, for your air conditioning system in your attic or basement actually smartly opened and closed ducts for different rooms? That's a whole nother level of efficiency that could be obtained. We're not even really close to that yet. Yeah. And um, it's starting to come, but man, the vents are pretty costly. Uh, and there's some companies doing that. So I, I, smart louvers would be one option. I tried one and it was incredibly loud. You have this whooshing noise of, because it's trying to hold back the noise right. in the room you're in. A one millimeter gap, you're hearing air blasting out that one millimeter whistling. It really needs to be a smart like octopus in your attic, the, the thing up there, the air handler that shoves air into the different rooms in your house. That thing needs to be connected and not with some, you know, Linux that needs patching a, a month or two later. It's, I mean, it could be Linux, sure, but it needs something like the heft of Ecobee 3, like trying to sell you, okay, here's what a $2,000 Internet of Things air handler costs or maybe an add-on device. And that's going to be a tough nut to crack. The billing industry teams to change, take incredibly long to change, right? Look how long it took to get thermostats to be updated. Um, but I think air handlers and air conditioning could be next, you know, I hope. Anyway. Yeah, maybe it, those those are those cycles are so much longer. It's like the automobile, right? It's we're having yeah. we're having trouble getting some of this tech uh, into cars because the the change cycle is so long. And you know, shoot, I'm I'm coming up. Um, you know, I, I've got a well. You and I own a car. It's just it's same year, same same style. My my car looks almost as good today and drives just as good at 183 thousand miles as it did when I bought it. In fact, it may drive a little bit better. Uh, a few things need to be fixed on it at the moment, but I don't have any plans to get rid of that car. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not able to take advantage. It's 11 or 12 years old now. I can't yeah. take advantage or I have a trouble taking advantage of some of those, you know, some of those new things are coming. Air handlers and, you know, HVAC systems are the same kind of thing. I've got this system. I don't want to replace it. They're, those are, that's a $5,000 deal. So Jim, I, I just got 
done showing you the world's fastest storage. And then I sound like a complete fuddy duddy saying, yeah, we both have had a civics that are from uh, 2006 for me, right? Where I'm still driving it, it still works. I, I, I'm trying to basically have a less than horrible footprint on the environment and electricity is pretty expensive in Connecticut. So I care about things like not overclocking a CPU to get 20% more performance because it has twice as many watts. That appeals to me, not at all. <laughs> Having something that's 60 watts that I can leave running 24 seven efficiently, that's appealing. It's kind of the same attitude with this car and house and everything else. So some of these things, uh, yes, they're leading edge, bleeding edge. But for our, as far as what's practical and what I keep and what I blog about, it tends to be the stuff I have for years that I'm successful um, owning and I feel proud of sharing that I'm happy with my purchase. Yeah. Well, um, Paul, one of, the, one of the things I've really liked about is I followed you over the last couple of years and the stuff that you do. One, you, you're not a one and done blogger. So you don't, you don't get a, an, a product, you don't unbox it, test it for 30, 45 minutes, uh, come up with some shoddy things and things that don't work. And I've even heard reviewers say, and it's got this, but I don't even know what this does And that, you know, it's like they, they didn't even work with it. And then that's it. The post is up, boom, it's done. The, it's sent back or they keep it or whatever. Uh, I saw you put up one of your posts and it's like update, 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 update. You had like seven or eight updates to the post itself where you had gone in and updated the post, and made some changes. So one, I really appreciate your willingness to stay on top of things and to keep the product updates coming regardless of how long you've had it. And, and then two, you're the most methodical, thorough person I know. You just you just do a great job of making sure that you've gone through it all, you've thought through it all. I, I look at your site and I'm like, how the heck? I think I'm busy. <laughs> I'm like, how, how do you find the time to be so thorough? And I think your consistency plays into this. You know, you can you just you continue to do the right things over and over and over again. Um, so, anyways, I just want to encourage you on those two things for people who have not been out to Tinker Try. You should definitely, this is one you got to book. I say this every time you're on, but you got to bookmark this thing. And this is, if you're in this space at all, this is the site you come to. Jim, I really appreciate what you, what you said. I, I, I really do. And uh, part of taking my weekends back and trying to avoid drudgery of, you know, virus infected laptops and all, I've been cloning VMs for years, been handling laptops in the family that break for years, making a VM out of them while the laptop's getting replaced, just shoving the drive in my machine, booting it, giving the remote access to their Windows 10 while the machine's away getting fixed. That stuff that gives me time back in evenings and weekends, trying to be smarter. And backup products, and you know I moved from Windows Home Server over to you know Veeam, that's also a success story. So I'll, I'll close with a story there. Kids getting ready for college, a couple days before departing. Hey, uh, I use Ubuntu more and more, not as much Windows 10. We have a Windows 10 with an Ubuntu VM, can we switch it the other way around? Let's install Ubuntu on the Dell XPS 15. I'm like, oh. Okay, this could be interesting. Are there Bluetooth drivers? Are there Wi-Fi drivers? Are there video drivers? Can the video driver handle a secondary display over Thunderbolt and Ubuntu? I had no idea, but I knew I was in for maybe something a little rough because it needed to be Ubuntu 17, it turns out, which is kind of their latest and greatest. And then, of course, I fell back on one of my tools. I've been backing up for Windows for years using Veeam. I'm going to go ahead and use Veeam uh, Agent for Linux. And that's what I did, and when you know, it worked. And even if you don't have a GUI, it's like uh, the DOS days, Jim. Remember when you fire up a DOS utility, and it kind of looks like a GUI, and you hit up and down arrow with your keyboard and left and right? Well, Linux, you don't even always have a GUI, right? You might have a server you're trying to back up. Pretty cool that they did a good job handling that as well. You just install the product, and it does daily backups, and now you send your kid off to school with a way to recover in case his laptop's completely hosed. And I just gave a, an old 512 gig spinning 2.5 inch laptop drive with a USB adapter, put backups of both Windows and Ubuntu on there so you could recover any which way you needed to if something horrible happens. And off you went. That's a story that's like practical, right? It's me dropping everything, dropping all blogging, family member needed me, nothing else is more important than getting that laptop ready for him going to college. And that's what I just went and did. But it's fun to then, you know, share that later with other people uh, with a quick blog post saying, by the way, this product I've been using for a year, saved my butt, you know, yet again, and sent me off with some insurance. I don't have to try to talk him through installing this, which he could do and we could do, but man, we spent some time with Bluetooth and video, all the things I knew we might spend time with. What do you know? Video driver was tearing. We had to do a new NVIDIA driver. Uh, Optimus doesn't work on Ubuntu, only for Windows, where you automatically switch from Intel and all that stuff. <laughs> All the stuff I suspected might bite me did. And being able to um, recover if things went horribly wrong in Linux, which they can, and just restore from a VM, a Veeam backup, 
that was invaluable. It was my usual bag of tricks. The same stuff I've been doing for 20 years as an IT pro at work, backing up stuff, cloning. It's all the same tricks. That's kind of how I get some of my time back, Jim, for just writing blog posts and some of the, you know, the stuff that I really enjoy yeah. instead yeah. of, you know, drudgery. Well, I, you know, you do it, you do it well. So thanks for, thanks for coming in here and making my evening. I learned a ton just as you're going through. Now I got some new, new things that I'm thinking. It's like, Hey, speaking of that, uh, the gym, no, Ken had asked a little update on Veeam. Uh, you, you've been talking about it for a while. You obviously you still recommend it as, as a backup. If someone was going to start using that moving away from whatever they're using, by the way, I hear from people all the time, Paul, that are still using Windows Home Server, which is just crazy. I Just recently, I think I've heard from two or three uh, who've said to me, uh, no, I'm still a Windows Home Server guy, and I still have an original 490 or 470. Uh, they're, doing it, uh, they're doing it that way. So I think you've locked up, Paul. Can you still hear me? I might have lost Paul. Paul, if you can hear me, just reset your connection come back in. Uh, and so uh, it's been a surprise. I'll we'll see if we get Paul back here in a second. It's been a surprise to me as I've traveled the country the last uh, couple weeks, uh, four or five weeks. I have, um, yeah, I've heard from a lot of people who are still doing home server, either I, I, uh, homebrew uh, where they built their own. Uh, I was at Christian's place. He's got a 490 in his closet. Um, you know, and then I just heard from other people who are like, yeah, no, no, I'm still a home server guy, which is, I met with a guy today who I was talking to. I said, you know, I always, uh, whenever I meet windows MVPs, I always tell them I'm a windows insider. And then, you know, they'll all say, but I came from the windows home server community from, Oh, windows home server. Yeah. I gave that a try, you know, and, uh, a lot of folks that, uh, come from that. We'll see if we can get Paul back here in just a second. I know I've said this a dozen times, but oh, here he comes. I'm a big Acronis fan for doing some of that. You're back. We we just locked up for a second. Sorry about that, but I'm glad I'm back. And uh, you were saying about Acronis. Yep, another product I've used. Uh, yeah, Acronis has been good to me. Uh, quick update on Veeam for folks maybe who haven't, you know, jumped in on it or haven't uh, used it yet. Uh, I know you highly recommend it, but updates to that or things being done, is that being actively developed, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, like their Veeam agent for Windows, they came out with a new update where even when I'm in a hotel for four days, like in Vegas, uh, five, six days, it's doing daily backups to a local cache because I have no VPN connection back home and that'd be pretty big a bandwidth hog in a hotel anyway, right? So it smartly does daily backups. And that already saved my bacon once. There was a driver, uh, a Windows update. It made something not work so well on me. I'm like, uh, not too happy with this. So you actually have a way to do daily backups and recover a file from the day before, even when you're on the road when you normally are not backing up to like a Windows share or a NAS or something if at home. So that's a pretty cool little minor innovation. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but within a month of me installing it in the new version 2.0, um, there it was, saving my bacon, where I was able to grab something from a, a day before and something bad happened when I was out and about. And then, like I said, you know, other operating systems like Linux. And they let you back up servers, Windows Server 2016. Guess what Microsoft doesn't let you do with Windows Home Server agent stuff, right? Their version, they would block it from their own server products. Not recommended if you're doing an Oracle database or production, right? You're not supposed to be, but if it's a home lab and you're just, you know, playing around with copies of Windows Server, very nice that Veeam also lets you do that. And yes, yeah, free. They have paid for versions, like 50 bucks a year or something, I think, if you want some higher levels of support. And I think that daily backup to a cloud, ca uh, a cache that reconnects later. Uh, you know, some of that stuff can cost money if you want it to, but no, the, the basic, Scheduled daily backup, all that's free and it stayed free. So yeah, that's enough about Veeam. There, there are many other products to do I that. Think they, they, I think it's good to look at. I, I think it's if you're a Windows Home Server, you know, those those things aren't going to stay around forever. Uh, Paul, while you were gone, I was saying, I'm hearing from more and more people. I, I say, oh, I'm not doing Home Server anymore. And they're like, oh, no, I'm still, I still have my Home Server. <laughs> like, seriously? And there's oh, people yeah. still in 2011. And it's like, I, you know, hey, I mean, hey, first of all, if it works, awesome. But there will be a day it will no longer work. And I, and I really do think, you know, it's not getting any better. I do really think now is the time to start looking at something else. You should have a backup plan. I mean, yes, I still run Windows Media Center for my wife in the living room at home. But there will be a day when win either Windows 7 or Windows Media Center stops working. And, you know, it's good to have. I've been spending a lot of time on Plex. It's good to have a backup plan. And so, literally, you need to have a backup plan for your backup plan. Right. So, you know, whether you're going to do a Veeam or you're going to look at a Cronus or you're going to figure something else out, I, I think those two are probably your best, the, your best one and two options for it. 
Yeah, um, think about um, VMs for a minute too. So VM native backup, what does that mean? So what if you have backup that is looking at a virtual machine and say, oh, I'm going to back up that VM. In other words, it's not an agent you install in a VM. Veeam also does that. So they happen to be well known to people who are IT pros and virtualization enthusiasts because they might be using Veeam at work to back up virtual machines. But for physical machines like laptops and stuff at home, they might you know, already trust that company. There are many others, uh, Vembu, Nikivo, Nikivo, and others have an appliance you download and you back up all your VMs at work. They're just getting into the space of backing up laptops as well. So the good thing I'm trying to say here is there's other companies competing in that space. And Vembu and Nikivo are two up and comers trying to take away some of the Veeam's thunder there. And that's good. That's it, multiple options for people and multiple people competing for a product you can trust to do to back up your daily driver, you know, laptop, whatever it is you do. Especially if you're like me and you travel and you need stuff to work when you're on the road for a living. Yeah. No, right on, Paul. Thanks for thanks for your thoroughness in this again, and and uh, really rolling through a ton of product. Thanks for saving my voice tonight. Uh, uh, it was great to just have you do ninety percent of the talking. I've been talking literally all day, and uh, my voice is just now starting to go. Somebody asked me today at the very end of the day. They said, "Can you do this all day?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, I can do this all day. Trust me." And I'm going to do it tonight when I get home as well. Um, I'm just getting to the point where I'm losing my voice. But, Paul, thank you for coming on. I'll ask you to hang around for a few minutes. We'll do a little bit of post-show. But thanks for coming on and, and uh, giving us an update. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me, Jim. Always great to be back here. Yeah, great to have you. Uh, we'll remind everyone, if you, support, if you want to support the show, and I mentioned uh, the first part of the show, if you want to get the, uh, the pre and the post-show, which is always kind of interesting. Although last week had a little option with YouTube. Um, Paul, I've never had this happen before. At the end of the show last week, YouTube video got stuck processing. So, you know, we run these off YouTube live. They got done. It's normally 20, 25, 30 minutes. It processes. I get a little HD symbol and I'm done. Download it. I can start editing it. Sat, sat. I thought, well, I'll just wait till the next morning. So Friday morning, I came back. Nope, still processing. I'm like, we have a problem here. Well, maybe I'll wait till the evening. We'll just see how it goes. Maybe 24 hours. I get home, still processing. So I shoot YouTube. By the way, if something's stuck, YouTube does have support. I didn't think they did, but if you go down, oh. the line, yeah, you reached, you go down you reached a human at the company. I reached a human at YouTube. Like, Ooh. yeah, it was pretty amazing. I sent. There's a little feedback and a help section, and you get an email, right? So I sent this email to him. Hey, I've got a video. I took a picture of it. I sent him an ID. This thing is stuck. And they said, well, we don't typically do anything until after four days. It it has to sit for four days before anything can be done. All right, four days. I'm going to DC. I'll just go and I'll handle it when I get there. So I get to DC. I'm checking and I'm checking and I'm checking it at the at the four day and one minute mark. I sent him an email because it's still stuck processing. Oh, by the way, going back and forth with a real person, not even automated. This was like a real person. We went back and forth and I made sure I said thank you a couple times. I really appreciate you guys paying attention to this. And um so I sent him a note on Tuesday or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So Monday evening, I sent him a note and said, hey, it's still not. And they're like, okay, we're going to send this off to an engineer. It may take a day or two to get this thing figured out. Okay, that's great. So I didn't hear anything from him Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday night, I get home. Boom. It's free. HD. It's done. They somehow kicked the video over and got it processed. It was all there. It was all the right stuff. It had just gotten stuck somewhere in the YouTube process. So pretty amazing. One, I got somebody at YouTube. There, there are people there. Two, I got an engineer to fix it. Uh, so if you're ever in if you're ever in YouTube land, it didn't, it's not quick, but if you're ever in YouTube land and something goes wrong, bottom left hand corner, hit their feedback, uh, and they have a little area you can go to to, to submit a ticket for support. And uh, and a person picked it up and gave it to me. So uh, so I say all that to say I couldn't get the pre and post show out to people because I didn't have the video. And so I waited for uh, I waited for it, and uh, and I got it, and I just put it in Patreon today. So if you want to support us, one dollar gets it there. Appreciate your support. It's just a great way for uh, for somebody to uh, to just stay involved in what we're doing. And I appreciate your support when you do that. Don't forget if you have an email, you want to send me a little encouragement or a little feedback. Got some great feedback last week. We started the newsletter weekly. Well, it's just one time. Well, do we do weekly this one? And remember, I'm just adding a short note, something in there, what's coming up, and the schedule of the next four weeks. And we have about eight weeks scheduled out. So if you haven't subscribed to the newsletter yet and you want to get notification of who's coming up, like you would have known Paul was going to be here tonight if you subscribe to the newsletter. I won't spam you in any other way. 
head out to the average guy.tv. There's a little subscribe button at the very top. It has the newsletter. Put your email in there. Sign up for it. I have about 50 of you that uh, that are on it today. Certainly, we could have more. And if you want to sign up for it, that head out to theaverageguy.tv and get that done. Don't forget the AverageGuy.tv platform, both web and media hosting powered by Maple Grove Partners. People get secure, reliable, high-speed hosting from people that you know and trust. Christian makes fun of me when I say that. and uh, But uh, I just saw Christian, spent the night with him at his place there in Virginia, and we had a good uh, we had a good time together. It was good good to see him and good to see kind of the HQ there in Virginia uh, for him. But if you're interested in that kind of hosting, head out to maplegrovepartners.com. Don't forget LastPass uh, sponsors our mobile app, and we'll get the Android one fixed. Sorry that it's broken. But if you head out to homegadgetgeeks.com, we thank LastPass for their sponsorship of those apps, and they'll be sponsoring them for another year. So we appreciate them. Amber will be on here in November sometime, late October, early November. We'll have her back, kind of talk about what's going on, lots of stuff going on at, at uh, LastPass. And, Paul, what are you showing me there? That's a great picture. Well, it just seemed appropriate, given you were just in D.C. Some pictures I took when I was there in May. It was beautiful weather. And uh, kind of reminds me of when you, when your television, your CRT tube TV, went off the air in the old days. If you fell asleep, this is what you saw as a flag or America there. So little patriotic picture there. Yeah, nice. I feel like we should be playing the national anthem or something. Yeah, as we're, yeah. as or we're sick and all the other, other people on the phone from you know, Canada Israel. and Australia. Let, let, we got to look at the comments now, right? See what yeah, doing that's true. That's true. I just, uh, it's funny because every time I go, we stay not far from the White House. So I like to take the walk up around the White House, down to the Washington Monument. If I'm adventurous, I'll head down to the memorials. Um, if I'm really adventurous, I'll make the walk down to Congress and back around. That's about a five mile walk if you want to do that. But I just took a picture. Yeah, I was just there. And uh, yep. the Secret and, Service guy standing with the blast door in front of her. I, I found it all interesting. Oh, just Paul, walking around it was the nuts. But yeah, it's just beautiful. It was weather. nuts when I was there. It is. There were there were people with boom boxes singing and dancing, and it was just crazy. Like I've been to the White House a lot. It was pretty nuts. So. It was a late, it was Labor Day weekend too, so you never know. And uh, the nation's capital is an interesting place to be right now. But uh, what's even more interesting is when you come out and listen to Paul Brennan live. That's even more interesting. We are here every Thursday. Like that segue. We're there every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out at theaverageguy.tv slash live. All kinds of different ways for you to listen, both live and online. Don't forget, we've got audio and video downloads for you if you want to get it that way. Do we do it every week? I've got eight weeks of stuff. Sign up for the newsletter. We'll be back next Thursday. And with that, we'll say goodnight, everybody. Good night. All right, Paul. Thank you. There's some. There's some chat. You have started. Uh, you have started some M. M. Two conversations out there. Uh, I think Kevin said Newegg is running some some open box deals on those. He said uh, he picked up a U.2 for uh, 325 at 750, no, 800 gigabyte U.2. Okay, so yeah, Enterprise, Hot Swap, uh, pretty cool. Yeah, not even that horrible anymore. So, yep, uh, rate adapters is the word I didn't mention, right? Um, and I mentioned that the last time I think I was on it in, in June, or sorry, in uh, March. The mm -hmm. point I failed to make tonight is when you have 10 gig coupled with fast storage, you lump it together. That's what vSAN is. That's what my day job is, right? That's the finishing part of the story. Same thing competitors will do, um, but it sure is simpler having rate adapters. What if you could take multiple machines, all the storage inside each machine, and make it one big lump of fast storage? And that's what you know. That's where we're headed uh, going forward in the data center. And of course, nerds like me are going to try this stuff at home. Um, not well, the most affordable to. thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah, course. Yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> I mean, it's required. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Honestly, though, it's still still pretty pricey to have four servers with a decent amount of RAM and 10 gig between them. That's still not something you're going to set aside just yeah. for demo purposes. So right. all the stuff I blog about, I use all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll yeah, get you there. Get, you get good use out of your equipment. That is the that is. Oh, I abuse sure. it. Like crazy. Yeah, yeah, hey. yeah. You oh, pound. Okay, it. Uh, yeah. I, I, Kevin Schoonover, cool. I did not catch up in the chat at all. It is hard to do that while you're talking. No, it is. Um, it is. I'm not good at that, but yeah. Okay, cool. Lots of chat. Wow. There's a lot to read here. No, there is. There is. Uh, there's a, a bit in there. 10 people live still. Cool. Hey, did you get the invite for the show notes that I sent you? I did not, I guess. You sent them over what? I, I did. Twitter DM, um, email? No, cool. I sent it. It would have come to an email for you, but let me make sure. 
let me because I you, you do such a nice job. I'm, I've got the ones. Hold on, I've got I copied the email in. I'm gonna have you. I think I've got all the links, but let me. I'm gonna share this with you via. What's the last thing we? What's the last so thing? So Jim, you just have a, you have. A, well, you have a draft for me to review an email, right? And I'm happy to look at that right now. And hear well, I've got it. Is that what you're saying? And I pasted it into a Google shared doc that I want to share oh, with okay. you. And you want me, to see if I find anything wrong with it or whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's it's your original email. But uh, let me just make sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in Twitter since that's the last place we talked. If you want to, I'd just like to have you review it to make sure we got... Um, I just basically copy and pasted your email in there. You do, you do the best job of show notes at anybody. So I want to, I always want to take advantage of that. I know you like them to be accurate and complete. So I want to make sure they're represented well. Uh, and I've got the 16 things you sent to me tonight. Uh, by the way, you did a great job of your own segues. I did. I was thinking, Oh, Hey, let's, and then you were like, and let's talk about the router. And I was like, okay, sounds good. You did a nice job of flowing. You just kind of flowed through them nicely. Every time I was thinking, you were setting yourself up for something. I was like, well, Paul, you think you were, and then you just, you, you, uh, you did the next thing as I was thinking about it. So I'm like, sweet. I don't, I don't have to do anything tonight. <laughs> I'm glad you feel the way I do. I tend to go on and on. Boy, in Vegas, no, we need to have you on, man. Yeah. I like it. Um, it looks great, Jim. I mean, you basically could paste it. I think yeah. all the links, it'd be fine. Yeah. It's, okay. Thank all you right. so much. I just, I just um, make sure you're I, good with it. Yeah. No. It, Thank you again for doing this. Um, this is a lot of fun, as always. Hopefully, uh, I like not to have you on every six months. No, I like to have you on every six months to kind of keep us. What what I'm finding and in, in what we do here is is you know there's a handful of guys like you who Kevin's one of them, who uh, who just every it's just good to hear from him every six months or so. And and you're one of them. You're doing a lot of work in that space. You're very thorough in what you do. Um, I need to get, I, I, you know, I, I need to get on here. I probably won't do it till after the meetup, but is McCabe. I haven't had him on in a while, so I need to get him yeah. over here. I think I've got get McCabe. Yeah, I do, right? It's right there on the list. Get McCabe on home server or on home gadget geeks. So this post to, show you're recording for Patreon or something? Or? I do. Yeah. So it's cool. for our Patreon folks. Yeah. Yeah. There's something I wanted to mention last week with Dwayne and VR. That was phenomenal. Oh my gosh, what a storyteller and how oh, engaging yeah. he was. And it was fun how you were saying as you're kind of ready to come in for a landing or you drop some little hint like, we don't have too much time left. He then went on for 20 minutes. It was fantastic. <laughs> but it was did. perfect. I mean, there was no, you should not, I'm glad you didn't stop him. It was unbelievable. Uh, yeah. The way he told the, the story, story, it was engaging. His decision process on which one they get, the cart. I mean, it was really good. So yeah. Yeah, Dwayne, hit, Dwayne's another guy like you that I got to get on every six months or so to kind of just unload what you guys have been doing and uh, he, he is really good. No. And I got tons of positive feedback on Dwayne last week. I mean, it was just, I got a lot There's of another one. who just said, yeah, who just said good, good. No, I appreciate yeah. that. You hit a high point. He's just uh, such a good storyteller. So uh, all these years I listen to you, I always try to learn and improve. I, I struggle with being like aware of myself or if I'm running on too long, I just get running and I stop thinking and that's a problem. No, it's great. <laughs> so no, you, it's you, great. You try to, you try to guide it back in the right direction right. or stop me when you I'd do stop. Yeah. Stuff. I'd stop. Yeah. If it was getting, yeah. if it was getting out of hand, I don't, um, you know, one of the, one of the things I've learned in the seven years I've been interviewing people is sometimes it's good. Just let people run. They get on a, they get on a, uh, they get on a roll with something. And, and I, what I find with myself is when I get on that role, I, I get self-conscious and I stop myself and I should just keep going. And, uh, those, those runs are good things. And so for me, it's a real joy just to sit back like with Dwayne. I know I can, I can uh, spark a conversation with a question and just let them run. And when I get that kind of positive feedback, like I just got from you or like I've got from others, from uh, Mike Weger, you know, the, 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 uh, longtime co-host. Yeah. <laughs> he's always great. Fun he, he him. loved it. He, he immediately sent me a note. He's like, that was the best podcast ever. Now we hit a sweet spot. I mean, he's, he's thinking about Bitcoin. He's thinking about how does he buy pro how does he, you know, dual purpose his product to, for VR and some of those things. He's thinking along all those same lines too. And so of course that just hit right on the head. I just thought it was very in with, with the, with the Bitcoin craze that's going on right now and the, and all this work on the blockchain, I just thought it's been interesting over the last couple of weeks, just really kind of highlight it. And what I loved about Dwayne's angle was that it wasn't, a, it wasn't Bitcoin heavy. It was hardware heavy. 
And he spent a bunch of time going through the hardware that he had and, and the reasons why he's doing the things that he's doing so he can buy more hardware. That was, you know, kind of the angle he came at it. So I, I really appreciated that. Yeah, no, I agree. That was a pretty good segue into why do you have that GPU or why you have it anyway? And here's something else again that was cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know the pr price of electricity varies a lot. <laughs> so I think some of the math there uh, doesn't yeah, work for all do. GPUs, right? But that, that, that was good, though. He, I should have brought it down. I just got that. So we talked about that Belkin uh, device where you plug it in between you and your piece of equipment and it, and it measures the draw and you can plug, uh, cool, in, yeah. You, know, you can plug in the price of power. I think here in Nebraska, we're at 10 cents a kilowatt. So you can plug the 16 or 17. Yeah. yeah much higher. A, yeah, than you. yeah. So, um, nice. You, know, you should running, show that on your next time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I should have brought it down. We'll show it next week. Got to got to okay, leave cool. something. We wanted to feature you, so we'll we'll. I wonder what I got next week. Hold on, let's. Your video got blurry, by the way. How do I look? Did we degrade in the middle? We there? degraded a little bit. A, a couple times we degraded. I'm not sure why. Things were yeah. good in the monitor. So as I'm looking, so maybe the YouTube will be fine. Yeah. I think so. YouTube we'll has some ways we'll of fixing itself after the fact um, as well. But uh, let me hold on. Let me let me bring up. I'm just interested. Where did my documents go? I'm interested. I'm trying to think who we got, who else we have coming on here in the next couple of weeks. I know I got, I'm trying to get Amber lined up. She's had a lot going on and they've had a lot going on at last pass. So it's been, it's been, did you say they doubled the price? They yeah. You mentioned that. I appreciate you mentioned that even though, you know, you work with her and sponsor. Well, that's fine. Call it. It'd be interesting to see if they can. It's what it is. Me to keep going. And, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, I do, I do just, still use them. Like a lot in there for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Nathaniel's next week, so that's always fun. Nathaniel Lindley's coming on next week. Rich Hay, we're going to talk about Windows 10, the Fall Creators update. So Rich is Rich is coming on. Rich got mentioned on Windows Weekly again. He's he's man, that guy. He is on Windows. Uh, he is. I caught that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's, such a, yeah, he's he is the he is the savant of Windows. He's just a, he is in there. And then we're gonna on the 29th. No, on the 28th, we're gonna celebrate. Or we're gonna kick off International Podcast Day with. I got Dave Jackson and Daniel J. Lewis and, and Ray Ortega, I hope, coming on. We're going to talk about podcasting gear. It's the one day a year I can kind of geek out on podcasting gear, uh, you know, microphones and earbuds and, you know, headsets and computers and that kind of stuff to celebrate International Podcast Day, which is actually the tw it's the 30th. So, but we're going to kick off that um, with with that so and then i have an interesting one on the 5th of october cody wheat's going to come on cody does a show called shots of history and it's a history of alcohol and it's really really interesting he's a he's a very very interesting guy and so much like barbecue we're gonna we're gonna walk through some kitchen gadgets that people use for cocktails which should be kind of fun uh, when we think about the the gadgets in the kitchen around what we drink so it should be kind of fun okay I'm going to ask a stupid question because we're not being recorded for a huge audience, but I got to no, ask. You, very small. you said you said Daniel Day Lewis, not Jay. the Daniel. No, Daniel okay. J. Jay. Jay. I heard what I wanted. To. Okay, there we go. <laughs> and then back to back to microphones. On my homepage, there's a big VMware logo, and I walked around and did booth visits. I should have mentioned that on the air, but that gets a lot of feedback. For two years, I've had a ninety dollar microphone. Does a really good job. So, Jim, if you go to my homepage, can you take a look at that? It says VMworld Solutions Exchange Visits. I'll just leave you with one last thing. I know you have all kinds of equipment. For, for people that go to trade shows like me, this thing really canceled out of the background. So, so, so click on the big, bright VMworld logo that says Solutions Exchange Vendor Visit Videos. Yep. Yep. Scroll down just a little, and there's the picture of the microphone. Yeah. So there's for Android or iOS, a lightning connector. That's it. I just use the regular app that's built into the phone. Uh, you don't need to do anything special or calibrate. You you can spin a little wheel on if you need to adjust the game, but usually I just leave it in one spot. And I walk around, and then I record a bunch of 4K videos that are image stabilized with the camera, and they come up pretty darn good. Uh, the background noise is minimal. You hear just a little bit of ambient noise from a conference, which is expected. And I've been using it for two years with great luck. So there's a you know something I'm happy I purchased. Um, What's the retail so yeah. on that? Uh, I'm clicking on it now, $89.99. Yep. That's super, super reasonable. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Um, that's a so great. That's a great way to do it. It's a. It's a great way. You know, the iPhone by itself is actually just a really good. Um, it's just a really good rig to have with yeah. you. Yeah, the and camera's it, getting better and better, and then 4K, it, and then you get image stabilization. It comes out quite good just holding the camera, which yeah. is the phone. In a yeah. pinch, in a pinch, that that it works really, really well. 
Another thing I discovered too is just turning on the light before starting. It adds a little glint to their eyes or a little life to them to show something. And if I go close to the drive they're holding or whatever, it really helps to have the uh, LED on. Because once you start rolling with iOS, you can't turn the LED on in the middle of a 4K shot. Yeah, well, kind of I saw a cool little device where it's a circle and there's LED lights around the outside of the circle and you put the iPhone in the middle. And then oh, you, yeah. can, it's, it's, uh, you can mount it to a tripod or you know, there's, there's certain things you can do with it. And I have found, man, that is a great, if you're going to interview somebody, you put that up, you have them look at the camera, and then you, you can hold the microphone off camera. And man, that works out really, really well. Get so you have a more. tripod and carry. Yeah. For me, yeah. I was, well, yeah. I was or going mono, back and forth to show them I need. Right. You can do a monopod on it. Um, the other so thing. What's the device called? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to okay. look it up again. It's a, it's a lighting apparatus. The other thing I might even consider with it is, um, who is it? Rode makes a, a mic that plugs into the port and it, and it's got a directional mic that sticks out like this on the phone. So here's your phone. I yeah. tried it. I yeah, actually was not happy with it. I'm, this what? microphone is better quality for me, even though it has, oh, sure. no, right. Um, on. I mean, it's only 90, but yeah, I stick it in the backpack, pull it out when I need it, put the phone right back in my pocket. I don't yeah. need, I have to chat or anything fancy. So, well, like uh, you and I talked about, proximity matters, right? And the reason you get such good sound is because you can get this microphone right in front of people. And that's why you're correct. So they're holding forward. it and talking, yeah. and we don't hand it back and forth that often. There'll be right. like two or three questions. Most of the time, the person I'm talking to is talking. Yeah. So it's not all yeah. that awkward. It yeah. would be cool if you both had like wireless lapel mics, but now you're up at like five or six hundred dollars a gear you're flying around with and batteries and all. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but that, so road, that was my that attempt. road mic in a pinch, like when you can't have, you can't carry a mic or you're, you know, you're trying to get into a situation where you're trying to get multiple people and you're not, you know, you don't want to be passing a mic around a lot. Uh, I have found, we have done interviews with two or three or four people using the camera and that road mic. And it does do a nice improvement over the, the iPhone mic from a distance. Um, well, mine was three years ago. We could be talking about a completely different product for all I know. I mean, I was, I know it was yeah. road brand, but yeah. 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 No, this one's, okay. this one's a, I guess it's probably a year old. And you know, like I said, I wouldn't, it's not the greatest thing, but it is, it is helpful in a pinch when you've got to, uh, when you got to get some sound from somebody and, um, and you don't have, you know, you don't have cabling with you. Well, it's also this big, so you can carry it with you pretty easily and just. Oh, just, nice. Yep. The yeah. Other, you, the other I, thing that's I, good for is the other thing that's good for is selfies. When you turn that around and you put that in the middle of a camera and you're doing this kind of stuff where the, you know, you're doing, you're doing interviews of yourself or whatever, where you're, you're getting close. That's another area where you, you get that mic a little bit closer. Although on the sixes, the iPhone six and seven, the mics are so good on them uh, now that it's, it's kind of, it's six to one, half a dozen to the other that close. Hmm. Well, Jim, I was in Vegas last year and spoke for six hours straight in that dry desert. Man, did that wreck me. This year I was a little smarter. I'm like, I got to carry water. I got to take some breaks. And I came home healthier. <laughs> I was yeah. a wreck last time. So yeah. yeah, I learned the hard way. Talking for six hours without a bottle of water, I was basically dried out and cracking and, mis you know, it was rough. Oh, yeah. I enjoy it. But then afterward, I'm like, what did I just do to myself? <laughs> so you must be exhausted all day talking. But yeah, thank you for doing this with me. Let's no thank you for for staying around, Paul. Thanks for coming on. It's always great to have you. You always you you always have great content. So I, you bring it every time, and that's what I appreciate about you. So thanks. I'm gonna look at the chat now too before going, and it looks like you already got the show notes. So wow, we've got this. That was quick. Wrapping this up. So yeah, thank you everyone for the chat and staying on the uh, chat wing there for so long and enduring me totally ignoring it. So I'll try to catch up. Nah, that. it's good. I brought the chat room in when we needed to. They were just uh, chatting among themselves. Guys, if you're in the chat room, we'll say thanks for coming out. We'll uh, we'll close it up on Spreaker. And uh, those YouTube guys that are out there, thanks a ton. We'll see you back here uh, next week. And uh, we'll close you out. Oops, I forgot. I put that over here.